Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to Setting the Stage, Production Design for Film and TV. My name is Kim Wanup. I am a set decorator, and I have worked on projects like The Good Place, Veep, and the upcoming fourth season of For All Mankind on Apple+. Plus. Um, I'm also the creator and host of Decorating Pages podcast, a series that discusses the art and love of production design and set decorating for TV and film. Production design can take us anywhere from historical periods to futuristic worlds and even the wildest of fantasies. We've got an exciting group here today of talented production designers who are going to dive into their process for designing the worlds of different genres for film and TV. It's a fascinating topic and I cannot wait to hear some of the stories from our panelists and get their take on it. I've had the pleasure to meet some of you on my podcast. Um, I have worked with some of you, and I hope to work with some of you. <laughs> so, um, and I think we all just want to work right now, so that's cool. Um, so, without further ado, let's introduce the panel. First, we have from the HBO series *The Last of Us* production designer John Pino. Hello, John. Hi. From the series, the Netflix series *One Piece*, we have production designer Richard Bridgeland. Hello. Hi. From History of the World Part Two and Drunk History, production designer Monica Soto. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. From Cassandro, the film Cassandro, production designer JC Molina. What's up? Hello, hello. And from World's Best and one of my new favorite shows, Son of a Critch, production designer Liz Bischoff. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so, um, I wanted to get the conversation started off by looking into projects that have different time periods, which I think all of yours do. So <laughs> that's a good subject to start on. Uh, if we can, let's start with John. The first project, let's dive in a little bit to The Last of Us. In episode two, we see Ellie outside of the QZ, which is a slum, and it's like the first time you see it. Can you share how this significant change in location influenced the design of the episode and what creative choices were made to convey the really stark contrast between Ellie's life inside and outside of the QZ? Well, um, when Ellie, Ellie, yes, Ellie grew up in the QZ, which is a ghetto. And so things there are pretty drab, um, broken down. And so when she gets outside of it, the world just opens up and, and it's a double-edged sword as far as approaching it from design and color choices um, because the episode is infected and I really wanted to go into the this thing with her is that she is inquisitive and she's amazed that there's this world out there with all these variations of green. But it's also incredibly dangerous and sad in the same way. So how do we show the, the wonder of this, you know, the outside world, and also show that it is not, you know, it's not a Disneyland. So we, I was using green a lot in this episode because it is a fungal color. And I both, in the show, I was always interested in um, how do I show that around the corner there could be danger um, from the fungus but also show that um, there's a realistic, broken down world out there. So there is a lot of green in this episode. It even starts off in a lab with a certain certain kinds of acidic greens and medical greens, kind of like what I like to call arsenic green in a lot of colors and tropical because it also starts off in Indonesia. It's with um, you know a tropical bent to it. And then when we get outside in the QZ and we see the vines and, and all the colors and the variations of green there, that is, you know, oh, I've, she's never seen this before. But how do I show that lurking underneath that is something dangerous? In various places, we did the same kind of uh, arsenic green, I guess I'd call it, the same kind of... Um, you know, over um, medicinal kind of looking green in spots and wallpapers and things. And there's just an overall um, fungal quality, which she hasn't really seen and she hasn't experienced yet. 
like in the lobby of the uh, hotel. That's with it. all the, you know, with all the, you know, there's a feckinness to everything here that is not in the QZ. And so we kept putting that into everything. And even in the museum, there's a, a bit of that pushed through as well. So the, it's, it's showing the, di you know, this interesting, like, wow, I can't believe, you know, there's this incredibly beautiful world out there, beautiful to her, but also um, dangerous. I think that introduction of green too, versus the two, um, the two sets really affects the viewer too because it, it shows the time lapse. It shows like the growth and how much you had to deal with greens and having that as the set dressing and, and in intricate in the production design. It's just fast. I love the growth of, of that. Yeah, um, no, that and, and a lot of that, you know, when they're walking through, that was all built and put in for them because that's just how um, Craig and Neil, you know, wanted you know we wanted it to feel real we wanted it to not be um a show that feels like it's on shot on a volume so there was a lot that that's all put in except for obviously if there's two buildings that are like this in the background that's not you know that's not really there but um yeah so that was important too and also in the qz there's a preponderance of an urban drab and out here you know, it's important to show the realism of nature to nature taking over. So that would, you know, also facilitate a lot of different kinds of greens. But there's a, you know, the fungus is not just green, but it's just, it was always interesting to me to show, okay, when I'm leaning against the wall, even though um, they would know because they've done this root walking, that there's a dead fungus there, there's a live one there. There's just a sense of, that kind of, uh, you know, it's not to be um, disaster porn, but more of like there's a danger in that um, that overgrowth. And and there is <laughs> there is a real danger in it, as, as, we, as we know from watching the the show. But um, in hey, uh, sorry, can I? Hey, John, can I ask you a question about the show? Because sure. all right. Um, I, I actually, I should have said that the show I enjoyed most recently was your one because we did only finish it recently and loved it. So, uh, oh, and, uh, yeah, I really admired the job you did on it. It was fantastic. Um, the thing I really wanted to know, and what, in fact, while I was watching it, um, I did a thing for um, this uh, movie about the tsunami a few years ago. And the, one of the biggest challenges was how to get a contrast between different places that had all this destruction and not for it to all look like the same place. Um, how did you uh, go about kind of responding to that challenge? Because I, I imagine a, that was... That is a great question because, you know, it, the fun, the uh, the overgrowth just does the same thing to everything, right? So I pushed the colors, even though you know I pushed them like there's a there's a you know like I would everything you know looks desiccated and looks like it's got that oh you know patina of you know muck about it, but I wanted to have behind that some bright colors so that they and they bled through or we got a sense of them there. We also wanted to try to pick places that would have, that we created, like it starts off in the um, hair salon. So I wanted to make sure that that hair salon had some colors from the past, from the when the world was alive. Like it had purples, magentas and things that would poke through. Um, so you can't, can't tell, that's not the best example, but in other episodes, we really try to have some places where that color peaked out. You do wallpaper. Yes, the, the wallpaper is a yeah. big, yeah. Yeah, there's a scene in the, the hotel, not so much the hotel lobby, but also when they're going through, a, they're waiting to go through some an area where Ellie's got her back against the wall and there's some incredibly vivid green behind her. So I wanted, you know, like there is this before infected time and after infected time. And the before infected time, like in the first episode, there's a lot of neon and stuff. And there's just colors like the, you know, like magenta and purple is a color that will not exist 
past, you know, infection day. It just won't be there. Um, so we wanted to bring hints in of that. If, um, so that that was one that was one thing. And the other thing was trying to have if they're walking into a place, try to make it interesting or a place where we see we get, oh, OK, this was something from the before time. You know, there's a what was in the background, I guess, if that makes sense. I hope it does. Well, you're trying to show like these. this was our everyday life and now it's gone. And yeah. Then, yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And also just a, just that, you know, like the color peeking through, like even though everything's desiccated and kind of has that, you know, spray of muck, there's, mm -hmm. you know, in places it's peeking through. Yeah. Um, it worked, for me, it worked really well. So uh, thank you. Right. Thank you. Well, let's let's talk to Richard about um, one piece. I mean, that having colors through magnet and everything, and then your show involves such a wide range of unique, fantastical locations. Can you share some insight on how you approach the production design to capture the essence of that universe? Yeah, it was. I I mean, it was it was a huge show because it's a travel show. So it was like every two episodes, we you you leave one part of the world and you go to somewhere completely different. We never go back to that place. Um, so it, yeah, we covered a, a lot of ground with all the sets. Um, I um, <clears throat> I actually didn't know the uh, manga before I started, which um, uh, funnily enough, I think might have been uh, a kind of help because it, it I had no preconceptions about it. I didn't have like a fan's idea about what this world should be like or anything. Um, and and uh, so I and also I had no idea what a devoted following there was. So uh, I didn't have a chance to panic and uh, run around with my hair on fire because of all the pressure of that. Um, but, you know, I treated it really as a as a kind of translation, uh, if you like, from a 2D world where like any rules could apply as long as the drawing style held it all together. Um, and, you know, um, and it's a bit like um, uh, having done science fiction. All science fiction uh, to me is a, is like a period movie that is then projected into the future. You know, if you think of any kind of like um, a great science fiction movie, um, they, they tend to be centered in a period. And so this, it struck me, this was the same kind of thing. It was uh, basically a period, it, it's a period project um, and uh, which is then thrust into the One Piece world, into this sort of world of fantasy. And it's important to have that, uh, that kind of foundation because you need to make, uh, you know, when you're bringing something from a manga into the real world, you've got to make it relatable and you've got to make it credible. You can't just copy stuff from, uh, from a manga because it just looks goofy. Um, and it looks like a cartoon and and you want to you know you want people to believe in this so my foundation was uh, 18th century piracy I cheated a bit I used 19th century as well um, but uh, and I and I kind of that was the bedrock of every single set there was a huge amount of research went into you know 18th century architecture and props and all kinds of things um, and uh, sort of based it on that and then we could build all the the uh, fantasy on, on top so um, you know, for instance, like the ships, the ships are pretty authentic, you know, we built and we built them all. Um, but even though they're kind of crazy with these crazy figureheads and the first one you see is a pink pirate ship with love hearts all over it and everything. But the important thing was to take it very seriously and make sure that this looked like a really scary and very well used pirate, you know, pirate ga galleon. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of time spent kind of aging uh, the, all the paintwork very heavily um, and, uh, you know, and, and just aging, uh, you know, all the construction of it so that it looked like a real ship. For the crazy, um, there was, you know, this, there was a duck figurehead on it. Um, and I just made it look as fierce as I possibly could and put jewels in its eyes so that you could imagine if this thing was chasing you down, 
it would actually be pretty scary um and you know and not uh, and and not kind of lean into you know the sort of the the uh, humor and car uh, cartoonishness of it too heavily um and uh you know that's that uh, that was really the the kind of main thing of it um there were clues that we were given um oda who uh, created the manga he did this book called the Rubaru, uh, which kind of gave the inspiration um, of places around the world that were inspirations for settings he had. Um, once I knew that, I then knew that even for places that weren't in that, I could kind of use that uh, idea to inspire other sets. So for instance, uh, one of the characters, Nami, she comes from this village it's meant to be super poor and you know and then they they get attacked by this pirate band of uh, fishmen and everything but um in the manga it kind of looks like a sort of slightly old japanese village it's a bit generic and everything and i thought well actually you know i've got to tell the story of this character so being led by the character, I was like, okay, so she came from the super poor village. Um, and we know that one of the things of, uh, of One Piece is that, you know, there's all this sort of multicultural settings and everything. So I took my inspiration from Indonesian vernacular architecture and we created this, uh, it was absolutely beautiful village, um, but with these, you know, sort of crazy high ceilinged thatched roofs and everything. But we made that as authentic as possible so that when you then put the fantasy elements on top of it, um, it had a reality, a consistency and, uh, you know, and a kind of relatability to it. So uh, um, and uh, so it was really always being led by the characters and the storytelling. It's gigantic sets that you have with like I have to say like the monstrous of the of the ships and everything just the combination of your use of color and and then um just how vast your sets are because you're always I mean the water is a huge element in your show and your design so well you're right it um they they were big sets this it was uh, I felt so lucky because this was old school filmmaking. You know, we built big sets um, and uh, it was something I argued for from uh, from early on because um, I just thought with a show like this, with so many sort of fantastical elements, if we started relying too heavily on green screen, then um, you kind of wouldn't believe in the world. It wouldn't have that you know, it wouldn't have texture, it wouldn't have smell. Also, you know, for the actors as much as yeah. anything, we've all experienced this, but you know, you give actors a set and you know, you give them drawers that, are, that they can open and it's full of stuff and everything. And they just suddenly feel immersed in this world. And when you're offering up a world no one's ever seen before um, and you've got no kind of, you know, it's uncharted waters, there's no sort of terms of reference. Um, you're, you're making up those terms of reference for the audience. It's really important that your actors feel comfortable in it and that the audience can look at it and go and, you know, feel like, oh, this is actually a real place. I'm saying with, with these crazy as it is and crazy as the stuff that's going on, there is a kind of there's a reality to this. I'm prepared to, you know, I'm happy to suspend my disbelief and, and believe in this, you know. So, yeah, we we built uh, we built big sets. Uh, fantastic. I I mean, I saw the first episode. Someone told me to, well, I have four-year-old twins. They wanted me to watch with the twins. I was like, it's a little, it's a little Quite dark, dark for them. I don't think yeah. four-year-olds. Quite <laughs> dark, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, mm, that wasn't a good recommendation. For me, it was. I was right. going to do a recommendation, but I was like, my kids can't watch this yet. Like, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think uh, yeah, speaking of different time periods, different worlds and everything, the history of the world, part two, covers a huge range of historical eras and themes. Uh, Monica, can you share a little bit of the most challenging or elaborate sets uh, that you worked on for the show? And what were the key considerations to bringing them to the screen? Sure. Uh, the I think the c consideration is actually on the logistical side of comedy sketch, you know, like 
it's sketch. So we don't really go back to the same stories or same sets ever. Every day was a new set. Um, and they wanted to be on stage for a lot of it, which is different. You know, it's a little bit easier almost than location because you would just travel. So when I built Noah's Ark, I had to make sure it was also a chicken coop for the Russian Revolution. And then that would turn into um, the Garden of Gethsemane or like I had many sets like that. I basically built um, a huge stage worth of. I guess permanent sets, but they were never permanent. You know, like the decoration and the painting and the finishing and the molding would literally do overnight changes, you know, to accommodate our shooting schedule. And I think, and like Drunk History in a lot of ways was really similar, but that we had even less money on that show, but History of the World, thank goodness, like we had that. So uh, we, did our, we did our best, you know, to stick to the historical accuracy of everything. I think that gave everything a consistent thing. But the breath, you know, the lightness of Mel Brooks and like we were constantly, constantly going back to, of course, part one, history, history of the world, part one, which had very like classic golden yeah. era sets. Like, you know, I was <laughs> a lot of those sets look like the Ten Commandments, you know, especially ancient <laughs> and stuff. So like that was definitely our ambition within time and budget. Um and I don't know, I feel like my my thoughts are going all over the place because it was really like, okay, we're doing we're doing ancient in this corner, we're doing 1970s in this corner, we're doing this. So it was a, a huge uh, challenge for me and of course our set deck department and props department, but it was really fun. Um, like specifically with Noah's Ark, you know, I would do stuff like part of the walls, there would be like screens on the outside so you literally just remove a layer like making these almost like lego builds where you could just move stuff around relatively fast within two days and it would feel different and the light would be different um what else i don't know but there was definitely like one-offs like we did build a whole higgins boat for a d-day short um which is the gross one there's a lot of like yeah <laughs> yeah big soldiers but like that was a really interesting and fun build for us and we had to like modify ours like the walls are way too tall versus the real one because we didn't have enough time or money for a backing for like a Normandy shore backing or a sea backing so and these guys are sitting and standing and stuff like that so just like stretching reality was part of it but I definitely approached it I always say this like I approach historical comedy like I'm the straight man in terms of art department and the design. It's historical out the gate. And then it's up to my comedian <laughs> collaborators to tell me how they want to do, you know, how to stretch it and how to make it funny. Sometimes I'm, I'm in on the joke, like it's a interesting piece of signage or or something like that that looks historical but is a joke. And we also like lean into um a little bit of time like I don't have a lot of time to heavily age a lot of our set pieces so we have to sometimes lean into like well it would have been new for of the course in the scene so like even though if on site it's like this looks really new and um yeah just being really uh satirical and referential like thank goodness like it's a Mel Brooks show and like there's so much to you know like touch upon like our civil war story was basically an homage to Blazing Saddles. Um, the Jesus story was like a little bit of Curb Your Enthusiasm, but it was also definitely like History of the World Part One, the ancient Rome stuff. And um, I'll talk about this later, but like the Shirley Chisholm segment, which was one of my favorites, like that's, they they gave me that script and they're like, watch Norman Lear show, Norman Lear sitcoms. And that was like really fun research for me too, so all over the place, but um, really fun. I don't know. <laughs> you, I mean, it, you're kind of the perfect designer for that project because you had done Drunk History. So you knew right. you had done this yeah. type of thing. Now you get a little bit more money and you get to like, the mobile <laughs> factor is fantastic. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm your girl if you're looking to, yeah. you know, make a joke in history. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I do have to ask, I do have to ask, uh, years ago when we worked on Bones together, did you ever think you'd say, when I designed Noah's Ark? 
I don't think so. Like I, uh, you know, I came, <laughs> we'll talk about our backgrounds, but like I came up wanting to make music videos and like really stylized, really like dark goth rock and roll or like, you know, type of sets. And I feel like Bones was definitely in that. It was like so slick, even though it was like, you know, a, a murder show. <laughs> and I thought I would be doing stuff like that. But um, I don't know. I've always loved period movies and like just the detail and like when it's when a piece is done with so much commitment from all departments, it's so great and really can transport you. So I'm really glad to be existing in that creative space. You know, I'm open-minded of course for different genres, but I, I would love to stay in historical comedy <laughs> for as long as I could. <laughs> uh, well, historical comedy, Liz, you have Son of a Critch. Um, and the show is set in 1980s, Newfoundland, Canada. How did you go about recreating the look and feel of that era in the show's production design? And what specific elements helped transport the viewers into that period? So, I mean, I really tried to recreate Mark Critch, who's the main character in the show. It's his, his, his childhood home and he plays the dad in the show. Um, so... I kind of started there with his his original ideas of his house, but I then kind of worked backwards thinking, okay, so this house was built for the radio station for their employees and and um, it's the eighties. So they'd been living there for maybe 20 years, but they weren't, they weren't the first um, occupants of this house. So I kind of sort of landed somewhere in the fifties and I built this sort of fifties bungalow uh, but they didn't have money, so anything that they had in there would have been added in the things that they bought. So all the kind of layers of the decades after the 50s came with items and bits of nostalgia and tchotchkes and things like that. So um, that's kind of how I I found the the place. I, I mean, we just we just literally. Uh, toured every uh, <laughs> vintage store we could find. And then um, besides that, people, um, people, I mean, it's really hard to get things shipped in, in, um, in Newfoundland. So people uh, gave us things right out of their house. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, um, a ki the kitchen came from, a, I don't know, somebody was renovating their kitchen in the town next next to us. And so we just went and grabbed their kitchen and the carpets in the bedrooms came out of somebody's attic and the, the, the wood paneling in the rest of the house came out of an old ice cream factory. And we just literally took things from people's homes or, or, or scavenged things from old buildings and we put them in the house. <laughs> and, and that's really the creation of that space. And what was nice was um, when, when they came to shoot there, everybody was there was like, oh, I remember that. You just sort of find these little bits of nostalgia that you had kind of completely forgotten about. And 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 somebody would just be like, oh, I had that when I was a kid. Or so they, every, it just it was just so great for everybody that that sort of nostalgia um, piece. And and yeah, I just that's pretty much what I did. <laughs> and two, for for it being his story and his life, um, I mean, him walking into those sets must have been something special. He, um, yeah, he said that uh, the dining room in particular was really just, it was just such a throwback here. He was playing his dad in a room that was so close to the room that was his dining room. And especially since um, some of the furniture in that dining room literally came from his own house he had kept his grandmother's furniture and it it was in his house growing up and we put it back on the set so it really was he said sometimes he'd have these strange flashbacks while he was sitting at the table like thinking like oh my gosh no I'm dead no I'm I'm myself you know so yeah it was it was nice it was wow. nice Liz was that hard for you like stress wise not not being able to like have access to a lot of things I mean, I was just in Namibia shooting for three weeks and I was like driving myself absolutely insane for not being able to have like very simple things. Uh, how was that? Um, it takes, there was a certain amount of meticulous planning that had to happen. You just really had to think really far ahead. Uh, fortunately, I had all the scripts at once. Right. 
So right. I was planning five scripts in advance so I could get stuff shipped in. And, and then, like I said, I mean, people were just so very helpful uh, in Newfoundland. They, you know, Mark Critch is a local hero and, and everybody was very generous. They, they'd love, they loved that some of their, their house was going into the set. Uh, so yeah, I think um, it was planning, definitely planning. And, and then at a certain point, it's about problem solving with what you have and make wow. and and making something out of nothing in certain cases or finding something that could be and making that work. And yeah, just thinking really innovatively and out of the box to try to try to reach those goals. Nice. I can't imagine. Yeah. I mean, I, and the shipping to there and then it was during COVID too, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you had like three whammies yeah. against you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I couldn't even get a printer in LA. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was yeah, it was. Um, you know, we did we did crazy things like things that we would normally just easily go to a print shop for. We, you know, we we got a um, a large format printer, and and I my art director is trying to shoot newsprint through that large format printer and jamming it all the time but we managed to get enough newspaper because because it's it's a period show there's no phones but there's tons of newspapers and and there was just nowhere to print that in Newfoundland so yeah we did a lot of um out of the box things of trying to figure out how we could do it there without having to ship it out because we didn't have time or a lot of magazines a lot of books a lot of handmade things a lot of yeah yeah wow. Just buy it. Just get it here. Just get it. Just buy it. <laughs> just well, just create it. Yeah. There just really, it. it was really yeah. about just create it. There was just, you know, everything like all the packaging that we we had in the show, um, all the the things that we like any anything that they ate like out of a package, which they did. Um, everything we just cleared and we recreated all that packaging. It was it was. Um, it was a lot. There was a lot of graphics in the show. So, and one 24 inch printer to do it all on pretty much. It's <laughs> crazy. Um, so JC, let's move on to your film, Cassandra, which premiered in Sundance this year and is streaming on uh, Prime Video. The film follows the life of gay wrestler Saul Armen. Saul, what is it? Saul Armes? I don't know. <laughs> I can't say <laughs> Armen Armenares. Armendaris. Sorry, Armendaris. I, could, I should have helped you more. Yes, <laughs> Saul Armendaris, um, who was professionally known as Cassandro. Uh, could you please discuss how you incorporated the cultural and social elements of wrestling and LGBTQ communities into the production design, and how your choices contributed to the authenticity and impact of this amazing story? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, um, anytime you're doing a piece that's about somebody's life, you have to be very careful, obviously, and you have to be very respectful to that community. And luckily, I'm a part of the LGBT community, but it does not make me an expert on lucha libre uh, in the LGBT community. So uh, I I actually, um, it's interesting. It's my second piece that I've done that's kind of a biopic, not really a biopic. I did Honey Boy, and that was also kind of in that world. So what I my my strategy, I guess, that's worked for these last two projects is to really, I actually just become good friends with the people that we're talking about. Hmm. So with Saul, uh, I flew out, I had the producers fly me out to go meet him and to just spend a week with him. And it was really, really fun. It was just really great to like get to know who he was. He was always somebody that I kind of knew about being that my parents were from the north of Mexico, where he is also from, uh, and being that I'm in, uh, you know, in the gay community. So it was somebody that I always kind of knew about, but uh, just spending time with him and really like just hearing his stories and just kind of taking some tequila shots and like really <laughs> knowing about what's happened and what hasn't happened. And uh, it it was really helpful. And then after that, um, there was kind of a period of time where like the, sh the film went down. It was during the COVID time. So it was kind of like, we don't know what we're going to do. So I kind of obsessed and I just started buying a bunch of like old Lucha Libre uh magazine articles or just like magazines and I just kind of like fully engulfed in like a kind of heavy research period um 
where I would be talking to Saul and we'd be kind of going back and forth of like uh, a big thing for me was like making there's different like there's different groups in the lucha world hmm. and so it's really important about like making sure that we're giving importance to the ones that were helpful in his career or in the in the fight to kind of get exoticos which are these gay out gay luchadores uh respect so there was obviously being mexico there was obviously the machista side and then you know so there's a group of people that were not so into it and there's a group of people that were so it was just about finding who those groups were and trying to like push them in the story uh but it was just a lot of research and kind of hanging out with with Cassandro with his friends Pimpinela and all of that group and really kind of just diving in and making sure that we're being authentic yeah um yeah um, can you talk about, were there a lot of specific challenges or like memorable moments when you worked on it? Like, or specific? Yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, it was an, it was a period piece. It's the nineties. So it's, you know, I, I just did a sixties piece and that was, you know, crazy. Uh, so the nineties was, was fun. Um, luckily Mexico is kind of still stuck in the nineties in, in some ways. <laughs> um, so the, you know, there was challenges, but it was also really nice to, to be in a country that is, um, that still has a lot of these things available uh, and functioning. Um, but a lot of the, a lot of the difficulty was, you know, how to tell the story in an authentic way that doesn't feel cheesy. I mean, you're dealing with Lucha Libre, which is already something that's been kind of exploited by American cinema as kind of like this joke. Um, so it's like, how do you put respect into that? And how do you make it something that, um, is you know looked at as as a you know not like a easy career you know it's it's a difficult thing when you're a luchador so uh and a lot of that came in the design because i really i really really pushed to make sure that we we're not creating the coco version of lucha libre or the frida Kahlo version or you know the kind of like overly you know perfect beautiful landscapes we really like I was like, I want heroin needles on the floor. Like, yeah, like, it's realistic <laughs> and it's gritty and it's like, yeah. So, so we really like, we really push that a lot, and um, yeah, just to make it feel authentic and to make it feel like like the struggle that it is, uh, and especially at the time to be a homosexual man in a very uh, machista sport. Um, so, so yeah, in the design, it was really important to me to just really feel the grit, and I think that me and the DP. We are like doing tests every other weekend, I feel like, just to make sure that we're getting the right amount of grit and to make sure that we're getting the right colors that we're not feeling too vibrant. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of work to to kind of find that, but it was fun. And it's yeah. you know, it's part of the fun that is production design. Did you have a lot of prep time or in the shoe versus the shoe time? That's it was so long ago that I can barely remember. Um, I feel like I'm always complaining about not having enough prep time but I feel like that's just normal uh but no I, I think we did actually have quite a bit of prep time and then being that I read the script like a year and a half to two years before that we before we even made it I was already like my mind was racing constantly so um I, I think we had enough prep time yeah um well, don't tell the producers uh, <laughs> it's also it's also uh, your project versus the others. I mean, the others are some huge scales of like, and Liz, like having scripts, like with a film, you have the script, which is so nice to be able to prep it and know it and not think like, oh, they're going to change that in episode three. So that's yeah. always so nice to have as like the film script. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so funny. It's I've been going back and forth from TV and film in the last couple of years. And it's just like, yeah, film is so nice compared to, the craziness of 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 series but the series are also really fun <laughs> uh fun that's an that's an interesting word now <laughs> i mean right. i think so i think I'll i think all, all of the work that we do is a, an extreme privilege oh yeah you know? I, like, well, I love it i love my job i love it yeah. i i absolutely love it you have to you have to love it to get into this and to like like really give yourself to it and look at all the research that all of us have to do and then um like some of the projects have huge fan bases you don't want to offend people john yeah. was up late playing oh. video games i mean i don't <laughs> but it's also like we get to become experts at things that we never thought we'd become an expert of yeah. like earlier you were saying about noah's ark and i'm like what is she talking about and then i like google the thing and i'm like what like that's amazing she's yeah. like she had to research noah's ark 
Like I did. Yeah. That's so great. Like, and I think that that's that's the beauty of all of our job is like we get to become these experts of like random shrapnels of things. <laughs> uh and then and then we move on and now we're doing something else like <laughs> well let's uh let's let's think of uh, i'm going to ask each of you have you have an all-time favorite set that you have designed in your career maybe some of the insights of that set let's go with jc first oh JC. shit um okay <laughs> uh i think uh I, ju I just did a series for apple uh with um with Natalie Portman uh it's it's a 1960s piece and I think my favorite set is the Hex department store mm -hmm. um and it was this beautiful massive massive department store like double story we built it and it was just like this kind of just incredible it was just such a beautiful time I think to be alive <laughs> uh when products were beautiful and everything was right. so well created and and uh, I don't know. I just I I think that's my favorite because it was just such a beautiful like moment and and also just having people from Baltimore come yeah. into the set and be like, holy shit, this is exactly what it used to be. Wow. I think that to me was the best feeling in the world. It was just like, wow, you you did it. <laughs> that's um, always that always feels good. Yeah, John, so. John, what do you have? What do you think? Oh, that's it's so hard. I boy. I was thinking about this. There's so many sets, right? And they're all like children. They're like um, babies, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that you have. I think my favorite set was on the leftovers. We built a Queenslander, which is a very unique, it's like Australia's house. And it's kind of a really unique mix of Victorian and a rural farmhouse that has a... Uh, Miranda around her thing. We built it in the middle of the outback. And it was just so amazing. It was totally functional. We made it functional. The toilets were working because the crew is like, you know, five hours from nowhere. So it was just so great to incorporate it into the land and to talk to the indigenous people there too, to get their permission. And there are these little um, animals called the little, you know, like there's all these endangered marsupials that we had to make sure we didn't build on top of it. And it had a working um, windmill that gave it electricity. It was just, it was just to die for location and positioning it working with the DP, figuring out the sun, mm. which is such a beautiful um, home. And, and it was supposed to, the leftovers is really hard to explain. It was supposed to encapsulate uh, people's kind of time traveling and disappearing and not disappearing. So it had all these clues in it and, and just to do it out yeah. in the middle of nowhere was just so great. Um, and just to sit in it and look out because it was all about what you saw outside of it. Um, that was probably my favorite. Okay. Also, it's just an interesting piece of architecture because it'll have Victorian trappings. And mm -hmm. then like a lot of things in the um, the interior, it has a corrugated steel roof. Oh, so it's a very interesting and learning about it too. Just learning about, oh, what's a Queenslander? What? How does it function? The veranda keeps people, they sleep on it in the a lot outside because it's so hot. Because of course there's no air conditioning. Oh, that's a that beautiful, favorite. like a beautiful set. I do remember that. I kind of remember that from watching the show. Monica, what do you got? Uh, I talked about it a little earlier. Uh, so for Shirley Chisholm on History of the World Part Two, they were like, we're gonna do it sitcom style. We're gonna shoot it that way. We're gonna have a laughing track. We're gonna have a live audience. And that's new for me um, and definitely outside of like, I would, you know, like I don't, I'm not a big 1970s sitcom fan, I, but I realize I've, I've watched a lot of it. So it was really nice to revisit. So like, again, like, thank goodness for getting scripts in advance because they told me really early. So I had a long time to like really sit with the concept and we did stuff like, you know, buy every book on sitcom history and I was able to send our art directors to the, the art directors guild to the vault, you know, and like mm -hmm. p literally pick out drawings from these Norman Lear shows oh, or anything awesome. similar. Like I had copies of the golden girls floor plan, yeah. stuff like that, because like the scale 
of sitcoms is so much bigger than I realize. And it's a little bit under proscenium, or at least it's angled differently if you have multiple rooms. So it was like a completely new build for me versus like your classic four wall realistic room. Um, and like, I also pulled from my favorites, like how did I Love Lucy build her sets and uh, the Brady Bunch, you know, I watched a lot of the Brady Bunch. So I leaned into that. I really loved playing with like the burnt orange and avocado color scheme. Cause to me that reads like immediately 1970s. And it gave it this warmth that kind of gives you like the CRT TV set warmth, right. you know, to be as extremely nostalgic. And like, we just had so much fun and like seeing everybody like arrive at that set, like totally gagged and like, I can't believe it. Like, <laughs> I can't believe I'm in the Jeffersons, but not, you know, uh, yeah. just had so much joy affiliated with that set. And it was so different for me. And it really like stretched my comfort zones, of course. Like, um, I guess I tend to like the sets that I'm scared of at first <laughs> and then you accomplish it and it feels like such a big, I don't know. Yeah. It, it is like such a privilege and, um, yeah, I think that would be my one. Um, I'm going to jump over to Richard. What would your favorite set be that you've ever designed? Oh, my God. It is such a hard question, this. I'm sure we all get asked this a lot. <laughs> um, and there's so many sets that you sort of love for all sorts of different reasons. Um, you know, what I came up with was uh, there was a show. Actually, funny enough, I mentioned it earlier on talking to John. I did this show about uh, the tsunami that happened in 2006. And I had to do, one of the pivotal sets in it was this destroyed village. And the um, thing is, the tsunami, when it came in, it would sweep everything away and there was nothing left. So there was, there was kind of nothing to see, um, but I needed something to frame the drama for this. So I wanted to create this huge environment of, you know, debris um that uh would frame you know would frame this drama and it was huge as well i mean the set was going to cover like an acre because it had all these different parts to it and everything so to give the set form um i was thinking well actually it'd be kind of cool if if it was sort of like waves you know um and and uh as i'm sure you know john will tell you you know it's really important when you're doing kind of debris sets to find some kind of form to them because otherwise it just looks like so much junk on the ground um so anyhow i built a model like a very crude little model i did a lot of arm waving in front of i had this magnificent uh thai construction team and i stood in front of them and waved my arms <laughs> around a lot and uh and i let them get on with it and the idea absolutely caught fire with them. And they and they were working overtime and they were like, no, no, we want to finish this bit. And, you know, all of this was uh, going on. And they literally sculpted this set because it turned into this enormous sculpture, uh, all made from flotsam and uh, debris and everything. And they sculpted the, you know, the, these waves. And it was and it was kind of magnificent in the end. Um, uh, just seeing these guys, it was it was like such a unique filmmaking um, experience because this entire team of people got totally immersed in this crazy project um, and they sculpted this set. And it, it may not be the best set I've ever designed, but it's um, and no one's ever come up to me in the street and said, hey, I saw the wave in that show, you know, um, but I think it was definitely one of the best experiences uh, of working, of building a set on a film. So especially uh, when everyone's into it, when everybody's into yeah. it, it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Liz, what's your favorite set? So it is hard, but it seems to me that my favorite set is always the, the last one that I just did because I've learned something new and I've, I've figured it out and I've gotten so excited at, and it's the, the clearest in my mind. So um, I just finished a show in Vancouver where uh, called a nice Indian boy, which, um, which stars Jonathan Groff uh, and Karen Sony. And it, it's flanked the, it begins and ends with two, Indian weddings and they were so fun to make. They were just so vibrant and colorful. And I got to create um, a really interesting stage for one of the weddings that um, is kind of based on a, a very famous Indian film 
uh, called DDLJ, uh, and there's a scene in the middle of a, of a mustard field. And so the director had wanted uh, a mustard field in the in in the in the place where they're getting married. So the entire area to be a mustard field, which we of course did not have the resources for in this film. But um, I created this kind of movie screen frame where the mustard flowers were spilling out, like basically a a trans light, and and with a with a the completely um, reflective floor, so that all these flowers and and the sky was reflecting in the floor. So it just it was just such a fun um, set to make. I also love the fear. I wasn't sure it was going to work, and I needed the rake and and um and to see it work. It's it when it was an interesting challenge was is always the best part. I think, and you learn the most. It's it's so fun. Oh, I love that. That'd be my, that'd be my one. We are getting dangerously close to the end here. So I wanna ask two quick questions. If you could give advice to people who wanna get into production design and the art department, can you give one sentence or one word of advice to them? Uh, Richard, do you wanna start? Uh, stock your mind is what I'd say. Get, watch movies, go to art galleries, all of that. And the more you have, the more you can bring to your designs. Yes. That's very true. Liz? I say the same, like explore all art, um, architecture, art, go to galleries, movies, everything, because you'll fill up with all these interesting creative ideas and um, and it becomes um, part, part of your package, really, of what you have to access. M uh, Monica? Um, I would say study drafting and get used to hiking i mean not to, <laughs> to build on everyone else like definitely you know have a have a curious mind have a creative mind but uh i came from film school it was awesome uh when i started working in art department i was like i should have taken more drafting classes you know i should have like really committed to drawing i was a painter you know like really shore up on what you love to do on on paper or if you're a builder do that um and the hiking is kind of a joke, but it, I call them art department hikes. You know, like there are a lot of days that you're you're really in the woods at 7 a.m. just going uphill trying to find the right spot for camera. And, you know, it's it can't be understated. <laughs> you have to like it. You have to love it. I think trust your gut. I think the biggest thing is we questioned ourselves so many times, especially in the beginning, I think. And I, what I've learned is just trust what I'm like, just trust it. Just just do it. And even if it totally fails, you can sell it. Just, <laughs> yeah. um, act as if. I always say act as if. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I think trust your gut because I think it's just, I don't know. It's just, I think especially in the beginning, you're always questioning yourself. And then you're kind of like, okay, I should have just done what I was thinking in the beginning because I would have saved so much more time. So, John, words of wisdom? Um, I would say learn how to collaborate because I think as creative people, we all fall in love with our ideas. And this was something, me coming from a fine art background, um, where you are the creative head, but you also need to realize that the best way to show your, your um, piece of the pie, so to speak, is to get the DP in costumes and talk to them and get them all juiced about what you're doing get juiced about what they're doing and i i think you know no one's i don't think it, i think you know again as as a artistic person and we all are we just fall in love with that drawing or that's you know set design so i i know i find that hard to do sometimes and i think it's something you you have to just learn and it doesn't hurt to get you know it's great when everyone's on the same page and the T you know, you're working with the DP to build the lighting into the set and costumes and you are, you know, and it feels like an immersive put together world, um, which is what world building is all about. So that's my two cents. Yeah, that, that those are all great things and everyone should pay close attention to that. Uh, so last question, what are you working on next, Monica? Oh my gosh, I'm working on this thing called the writer's strike. Um, yeah, yeah, it's great. I'm yeah, clever it's on like, that too. It's the biggest <laughs> show. Uh, the actors just joined us. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a wild west. Right now. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. this is uh, one of the only times I'm comfortable saying I don't have anything lined up yet because everything has been hit with a pause button. But, you know, I'm feeling the solidarity. I can't wait to see everybody, you know, when we finally get this all settled. And I hope everybody keeps their rights at work. <laughs> That's is, it. Is, well, let me ask you this. Is anybody working? Does <laughs> anybody have anything? Okay, how about this? My is last anybody- day of work was yesterday. <laughs> well, there oh, go. I'm good. Anybody have oh, anything yeah, coming actually, out? What's coming out? What do you got? Anything coming out? <laughs> I I take that back. I I did uh I did because I wasn't designing it, but I I got to do some set design for a reality competition show for kids. It's untitled, but it's going to come out on Amazon. There's a lot of great work like that. There is at least you know like creative, uh, kids shows, reality shows happening in LA, and thank goodness. <laughs> but, John, yeah. are you? Do you have anything coming out or working or? No, no, I'm, I'm, there's, everything's shut down. I know. I wish I could say that there's some secret project. Yeah. Jug, juggernaut. That's going to just explode. Yeah, but no. Uh, so, JC, you just finished up on something? Yeah, I was doing a film uh, in Mexico and in Namibia. That was very fun. Yes. Um, yeah. Awesome. For, uh, for Amazon. Nice. And then Richard or Liz? Taking taking a time um, off. <laughs> well, I'm 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 busy doing commercials. So there, um, there you go. And, uh, yeah. So you know, uh, um, which is keeping body and soul together. Um, and uh, I got a project that I did earlier this year. That's coming out in November. Uh, which we did this crazy movie that's all on the back of <clears throat> um, Jennifer Lopez's next album. So a very different kind of project, but. It was a big world building project again and a fantastical world. So that was, you know. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have to say it was the hardest thing I've ever done. We had so little time and so little prep time. Uh, you know, it was like juggling lots of plates all at once. But yeah, no, it, it, you know, it was good. Yeah. A lot of fun. Oh, that's fun. Liz? And yeah, like I mentioned, um, there's the... The show I did in Vancouver, it's um, I think they're hoping for Sundance. So that's um uh, that should be out soon, I guess. Um what's it called? <laughs> it's called The Nice Indian Boy. The Nice Indian Boy, right. Is it a series or a film? It's a feature. It's a um it was it's based on a play that was in Chicago. Um, and uh it really kind of talks about uh uh, it's a gay rom-com uh, where um, an Indian boy is is having to kind of deal with his parents' expectations about marriage, about who he's going to marry, and and he falls in love with a a, a white boy, and and then the race issue as well. So it's it's funny and it's very sweet and um, and it's very colorful. There you go. <laughs> so it was really fun to do really fun. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Well, thank you so much to all of you for joining us, John, Richard, Monica, JC, and Liz. Brilliant and insightful conversation about production design. Thank you so much. And such different projects and how you all work is just always fascinating to hear about. Thank you to the Production Design Collective and Impact 24 PR for putting this panel together and that uh, you're all watching. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.